Today we are looking at our intro to oscilloscope lab. So we have a function generator, a signal generator, that is set to a frequency of 150 hertz, and that's generating a sine wave signal, and that signal is being input to channel one of our oscilloscope. So we only have one signal, so what you're seeing is um, just from this signal generator. So we see a sine wave form on the screen of our oscilloscope. And we're going to talk about a few things, a few buttons on your oscilloscope that you should be familiar with. So if you look on your oscilloscope, um, we have horizontal, which means that these buttons control the horizontal positioning of your graph. So position, I can move my graph across. Notice I'm not changing the dimensions of the graph, I'm just physically moving it. If I look at my time for division, so right now it's set to one millisecond, which means that each division horizontally represents one millisecond. So what we mean by division is this block. So each block on your oscilloscope represents right now one millisecond of time. So the big blocks are your division, and then we have marks. We have four marks per division. So each mark represents 0.2 of a division. So each block is one division, each mark is 0.2 of a division. So you go from 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, one division. Okay. So when you're reading your oscilloscope, you want to make note of your time per division. Because if you change your time per division, I change it from one to two. So now I have more waveforms per unit time. Again, if I increase it to five, I have more waveforms per unit time. And then if I decrease the time per division, I have less waveforms. So now it's at 0.5 milliseconds per division. So I have less waveforms per unit time. So generally, when you're reading, you want to get, sometimes you say at least two waveforms um, in your view. But honestly, you just need enough to go to read from, to get one period reading which should be to go from peak to peak, or trough to trough, or from this point back to the other point, okay? You just want enough in your view to give you a good, um, <clears throat> clear reading to get your period. So you use your time per division and your number of divisions to get your period, and then your frequency is one over your period in seconds. So make sure you convert your milliseconds if it's in milliseconds to, um, to seconds. So now we have the vertical options or buttons for our oscilloscope. So just like the horizontal position button moves it across, it's the same thing for a vertical position button, just moves your waveform up or down your screen. And that's good for when you wanna make a reading. So if I want to read a time from peak to peak to get my period, I can move my waveform down and then move it across a little bit so I can easily read off the time or the divisions from peak to peak. All right, so that's how you use these buttons. You can't just use them to get proper readings. So the volts per division is what adjusts your vertical scale. So right now, we are at one volt per division. So if you follow this black marker, so it's one, and this is volts per division. And I can change that. So I can increase my <clears throat> amplitude. So of course, it's not gonna fit on the screen. I can also decrease it, make it two volts per division. This is five volts per division. So five, two, this is one, again, if I make it smaller, my amplitude goes up and it's unreadable. So generally, you want to choose a good ratio where you can get a good reading um, from, generally, you read from peak to peak. So if I take this down and then move it across, you want to read from peak to peak and take a half of that to get your um, amplitude and then generally use that to find our root mean square voltage, right? So, and again, we only have one channel, so everything here is 
related to this one signal generation. So just make sure that you're, you record your volts per division and your time per division. Um, so again, right now it's one millisecond and I've put it back to one volt and we're going to use that to find our frequency of our signal compared to the frequency that's shown on our signal generator and we'll calculate the root mean square voltage. Okay, so now we've changed the frequency to 300 hertz and I'm going to adjust my time per division and my volts per division so that I have um, a good representation of the waveform on my screen before I take my um, measurements. So if I go, so it's too many waveforms. So 0.5 milliseconds per division seems to be a good enough representation. Let's see if I can get, so my voltage will be too high at 0.5 volts and it's too small at two. So actually remaining at one volt seems to be key. So now my time per division has changed. Um, and let's say I can move my graph. Actually, my peak is nicely lined up, so I can just bring it down. All right, so we can read from peak to peak to get your, um, your period. And again, now your time per division is 0.5 milliseconds. Right, so I'm going to zoom in a little bit so you can see it. And then I'm going to move it back up. So let's see, if we move up, we want to go from peak to trough and then take one half of it. So I'm going to move my waveform just a little bit up around and up a little bit. All right, so now you're measuring from peak to trough. And again, this is one volt per division. So let's take a look at the Lisa's U figures. So we have two signal generators. They're both outputting a frequency of about 90 hertz, and they're both sine waves. We have the volts per division set to be the same, so the amplitude of both incoming signals is the same. And right now, they have uh, the same frequency. So if you look in the oscilloscope, we have essentially a circular Lisa Zhu figure. Um, because they're not staying exactly at 90, our figure is not stationary. But essentially, because they are the same frequency, our figure is circular. So now let us um, change the frequency of one of our signals. So this will be our channel two signal, which is our Y signal. So I'm going to change the frequency of this to 180, which will be twice the frequency of my X signal <coughs> with respect to time. So now this is my frequency is twice of my frequency on my Y channel is twice the frequency on my X channel. And again, my amplitudes are the same. So we are momentarily, we will see the two lobed figure that is representative of the frequency of one signal being twice the frequency of the other signal. And again, this is for my Y, which is why your lobes are horizontal. Okay, so that's the two lobed figure for the frequency of your Y channel or Y axis being twice the frequency of your X. And um, let's see if we can get figure five of your textbook, which would be when Y has a frequency that's three times the frequency of X. So that'll be three times 90, which is about 270. 
going to be exactly to the 70, since channel 1 is not exactly 90, but it's get close to it. So here you see you have this three lobe figure that's shown in figure five of your textbook is again the frequency of my Y is about three times approximately. It's approximately 270. This is approximately 90. So it's three times. So this again, remember this is Y. It's three times the frequency of X. And so we have the three lobe figure which looks just like we have in figure five. Um, and so again, these are the images you get when your frequencies are integer multiples of each other. So if they're not integer multiples, then you don't get um, the lobes, you get what looks like noisy signals. Um, pretty patterns. Okay. But again, you get the number of lobes would be equal or equivalent to the integer multiple of the frequency of one channel to the, to the next. So now let's look at what happens if I change the x relative to the y. All right, so we're back to the beginning. We have both channels at approximately 90 hertz. And so we're back to our circular figure on our oscilloscope. And so just now I changed the y frequency, again, this is my channel 2, which is my Y. So now let's see what happens when I change my X. So if I change my X frequency, so I'm going to change this from 90 to 180. All right, and we get the same two lobes, but now instead of your lobes being horizontal, your lobes are vertical. Okay, so it looks like a figure 8 instead of an infinity sign. And now let's go to 270, so I'm changing my X frequency to be three times my Y frequency. And so I'm close. And I'm trying to get the right too far. Now we have our three lobes, but again, our three lobes are now vertical instead of horizontal. Okay, and you'll get a feel for some of this as you do um, the advanced study exercise if you haven't done it already. And we are not going to show you right now about a shift in phase. We're going to explore the phase shift when we look at. Um, our phase measurement lab for our C circuit. And we're going to do this again and use our least issue figure to calculate the shift in phase. So right now, we have very, very small shifts in phase, um, mainly because our signal generators are not staying still, but we don't have a constant phase shift. And of course, throughout this, they were all at the same amplitude. 